We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela, Dei Mater Alma, Ad Semper Virgo, Felix coming at you with Charles Colomb, author of the next book of his, Blessed Charles of Austria, which is, I think it's coming out in August, so it's on for pre-order. But Charles, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, my very next book was indeed written by me. You're right. <laughs> it's very true. Now, this man has shrines all over the planet. In the North America alone, he has 16 shrines, 14 in the United States. Yeah. Who is this guy that made you want to write a book about him, and why is he so popular with everybody? That's a good question, and the answer is several fold. Uh, why did I write the book? Well, I was paid to by 10 books, that's why. <laughs> but, of course, I had a particular interest in doing so. And the interesting thing was that the, the request came at a time when I was very strongly contemplating moving to Austria. For schooling, mm -hmm. and to have it have that offer came when it did. I thought, okay, I'm going. You know, you don't you don't have to kick me three times in the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> I I, it's all right. I'll go. I, I know when I'm being pushed by providence. <laughs> so, there've been two so far the most uh, unusual and uh, enjoyable years of my life, even despite lockdown. So. Now then the question comes, who was this man and why is he so popular? Well, let's divide that into two parts because those are two questions. The first question is, who was he? And the answer is, blessed Emperor Charles I, Emperor of Austria, Charles IV, King of Hungary, Charles III, King of Bohemia. Mm -hmm. He was the last Emperor King of Austria-Hungary. Uh, he was beatified by Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, who, but incidentally, was named after him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, beatified by him in 2005 because, you see, the Pope's father was a very loyal member of the Austrian army. Mm -hmm. So he named his son Karl after the emperor. And many years later, Karl's widow, who outlived him by a very long time, she only died in 1989, uh, he died in 1922, she died in 89. Uh, she came to the Vatican, she was very devout. In fact, uh, her cause for beatification has been introduced. And she's a servant of God herself. But she went to go see Pope John Paul II, and he said, it is a tremendous honor to meet my father's empress. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, who was it? Well, interesting chap. He was the uh, great nephew of Franz Josef, who uh, was the Emperor of Austria from 1848 till his death in 1916. Uh, he, his father was um, the nephew of Franz Josef, his grandfather being Franz Josef's brother. Mm -hmm. Now his uncle uh, was Franz Ferdinand, who after uh, Franz, Franz Josef's son died, became the heir to the throne. Uh, through a, a series of strange events, uh, Carl, who was not when he was born anywhere near being heir to the throne, because Franz Josef's son Rudolf was alive. Uh, Franz Ferdinand was the older of the two brothers, uh, uh, but and he had not yet married. But he was 
doubtless going to. So there'd be a whole bunch of kids there. And then, of course, it was Carl's father. So the likelihood was that uh, Carl would never be king and emperor. But his um, cousin Rudolf was killed or, uh, you know, killed himself or was murdered uh, at Meierling. Very, it was really the JFK assassination of the 19th century. <laughs> it's still a mystery. Um, all sorts of strange tales about it, and I do deal with them in the, in the book. Mm -hmm. So he was out of the way. And then uh, Franz Ferdinand marries all right, but he marries morganatically. That means he marries a non-royal, which means that his children can't inherit the throne. So he becomes the heir to Franz Ferdinand. Uh, his father dies before he does. And so by the time Franz Ferdinand is murdered and World War I breaks out, he was the heir to the throne. Now, he was an interesting character because his, uh, well, for a lot of reasons, frankly, his parents were very badly suited to each other. Uh, his father was a ne'er-do-well, a roué, tons of affairs, a gambler, lighthearted, very fun. People loved him. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sorts of scandals that other people couldn't get away with the Viennese papers just lauded him. Our, our Otto, you know, Schönster Otto, uh, Otto the, the, the handsome archduke, this kind of thing. He, he could do no wrong as far as the Vienna papers were concerned. But he was not what you would call a deep thinker and not the most moral of men, to say the least. So he was paired off with a Saxon princess, uh, the Archduchess Maria Josefa. She was very, very devout, but kind of doer. You know, not the most exciting person. So, when initially when he got married, Otto thought he was in love. But after she gave birth to Carl, that kind of dulled, and he began to fall back into his old ways. Then she gave birth to another son, and he straightened up and flew right for a while. Mm -hmm. But in the end, unfortunately, he died of syphilis. Now, this is a terrible story. And for a lot of people, it would be why they were so ter such terrible people. Not Carl. He, interestingly enough, and, and this is why I, I say toward the end of my book, that while he was a brilliant soldier, a great ruler, a tremendous husband, a tremendous father, he had one other quality that I don't think anyone else has touched upon. Perfect patron for broken homes and difficult families. Mm -hmm. Because he loved both of his parents, and he got the best out of them. From his dad, he got his easy manner, his sense of humor, his unsinkable personality, his effervescence, but not the immorality and not the shallowness. From his mother, he got the deep piety and the devotion to duty and all that, but not the dourness and the... You know, so he managed to uh, get on very well with both his parents, as I say, and took from each of them the very best. He was very devout from the beginning, but he was also full of fun from the beginning. And so it's as though he, he reflected the best of each of them. I, I, I hate to think of somebody who was you know, as, as immoral and shallow as the father and as doer as the mother. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be a real killer combination. I mean, we'd probably elect him to something over here, but still, it would it, it, it would not be it would not be nice. As, uh, as they say, joyful saints. So he was a joyful saint to begin with. Yeah, he was. He really was, and very devout, very much to the Blessed Sacrament, and the Sacred Heart, and the Rosary. Uh, but also very much uh, very human. He uh, he took to soldiering like a duck to water, <laughs> and he was very good at it. He was one of the very very few uh, rulers in World War One that had actually been at the front. Oh wow! There were only a couple of others, yeah. but that was why they called him the Peace Emperor because as soon as he became emperor, he wanted the war to end. He wanted it out because he knew what was happening. 
he knew the horrors the men were facing up front and personal. It's interesting that, uh, to my knowledge, the only other heads of state who did something similar were, oddly enough, Austria's great enemy, the King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, and the King of the Belgians, mm -hmm. King Albert. There was one other person, the anniversary of whose death was yesterday. Uh, he wasn't a ruler at the time, but he ended up becoming one. And that was the Prince of Wales, uh, who became Edward VIII. He was so close to the front that he literally saw a chauffeur killed in front of him. Oh, wow. And that's why, you know, when people say, oh, Edward VIII was pro-German. No, he wasn't pro-German. But he was definitely not pro-war. Because, like, unlike so many of the people who were talking about it, uh, he'd, like, seen it, you yeah. know. My Different father, perspective was, when you're there. Well, yeah. I mean, my, my father was a tail gunner in World War Two. He used to say that uh, there are no pacifists like soldiers who've actually seen the elephant. Yeah. And they used to ask my dad all the time. They found out he was a nom and asked him about it. And he'd quickly give a, the worst story in the planet to get them to stop talking about it. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, yeah, that must be great. Uh, no, yeah. you do you do the best you can, and that's it. But at any rate, with uh, with Carl, he um, was a remarkable young man, and he met an equally remarkable young lady, and she was a princess of Bourbon Parma, which was one of the little Italian states that were overrun in 1860 by the Sardinians. Mm -hmm. So she grew up all her life in exile. Um, but she too, very strong-willed character like her husband, very devout like her husband. And after they got engaged at the great shrine of Maria Cell, they made the pilgrimage there. And Carl said to her, Charles said to her, now we must help each other get to heaven. And his marriage was a huge thing to him, mm -hmm. as was fatherhood. You know, all they'd have eight children together uh, in rapid succession, including one born after he died. Wow. Which shows you they didn't stop. He was exiled. Was How many did he have out in exile? Seven. Seven in exile? Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So uh, he, uh, he had a problem, and the problem was... As, as heir to the throne now, or as heir to the heir. Mm -hmm. uh, Franz Ferdinand was his uncle. And they were actually very close. And this, too, is another interesting thing about Kaiser Karl. Uh, Franz Ferdinand and Franz Josef did not get on very well. Uh, Franz Ferdinand, of course, had married morganatically, which his uncle was dead set against. But it was a very happy marriage, you see. Unlike Franz Josef's own marriage. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, Franz Josef wanted to maintain the status quo. Franz Ferdinand believed that Austria had to become federated with all of its different peoples basically inhabiting their own country, with the emperor over them all, keeping them in tandem. Well, Franz Josef didn't like that, and neither did the Hungarian liberals. Uh, Austria-Hungary was just that. It was a dual monarchy at that time. Mm -hmm. So you might be Emperor of Austria, but you're also King of Hungary, and you had differing roles. All of that would face Karl when he became Emperor. Um, he uh, was very fond of his fond of both his great-uncle and his uncle, and I cannot help but think, because a lot of writers have mentioned the fact that despite their antipathy to each other, they both got on very well with, with Karl, who did not set up like a third center of intrigue or something. And in thinking about it, you know why he got on so well with his uncle and his great uncle both? It's the same reason he got on so well with his parents. He loved them. Simple. Sometimes the solutions to these questions are not really that difficult. Yeah, just simple. He loved them. Yeah. So um, Franz Ferdinand, as you know, was murdered. That was the beginning of World War One. Uh, Carl went off to the front and actually to several fronts because he would constantly report back to his great uncle about the progress of the war. Mm -hmm. So he was in Galicia, he was in Transylvania, he was on the Serbian front, he was in, uh, on the Italian front when that opened up. And in fact, interesting story, 
they have flash floods in that part of the Alps. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that there was a soldier who had been wounded and so it was being used basically to mine the horses in a sort of uh, ad hoc stable they had. This wall of water comes down, and he's not quite a cripple, but you know, he's not in good shape. The water knocks him into the into the stream. Well, Archduke Carl jumped into the stream and rescued him. <laughs> I mean, that's just an amazing story. So. Uh, his uh, great uncle dies he becomes the emperor in 1916 and he has two definite goals peace and federation the problem was he couldn't do his peacetime goal without solving the war and he couldn't solve the war without accomplishing his peacetime goal <laughs> and what made things even more difficult was that in the end both our own Woodrow Wilson and the French Clemenceau were absolutely, for ideological reasons, resolved to destroy Austria-Hungary. So, did it was it true that uh, Benedict the Fifteenth wrote that the uh, was it the peace uh, the begged for peace and uh, Blessed Carl was the only one that basically was following it? Pretty much, he was the only one who gave a, a really positive response. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm sort of hemmed and hawed and thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, our president said, stay out of politics, church, uh, churchman. Mm -hmm. Only essential services, he said. Everything else has to be shut down. Oh, sorry, <laughs> different politician to a different... Never mind. <laughs> I didn't mean any of that. <laughs> so... I don't want to. I don't want to get you know present horrors mixed up with the old ones. <laughs> so, in the end, uh, the Austrians and the Hungarians and so forth were faced with kind of an ultimatum. They had to get rid of the emperor or starve, <laughs> because uh, Woodrow Wilson made it very clear that they would not lift the uh, embargo otherwise, and they were starving quite literally. So. I go into great detail about this, but the long and the short of it was that uh, Carl had to go into exile in Switzerland. Huh. And when he did, um, he nevertheless, nevertheless still felt responsible for his countries. He never abdicated, you say. Mm -hmm. And then, in, uh, in the meantime, the government that took over in uh, Hungary was run by a communist named Bela Kuhn who soon put in a communist dictatorship. They had a secret police. They were doing all the fun stuff the communists do. Mm -hmm. And then they were overthrown by a combination of Romanians and Hungarian right-wingers headed by a guy called Admiral Horthy, who claimed to be the regent to the king. But when the king started making noises about coming back, suddenly Horthy wasn't all that keen. So he made two attempts to uh, return to his Hungarian throne. Both times, the French foreign minister said, if you succeed, we'll back you up. If you don't, we won't. <laughs> Thanks. So he did not succeed either time. And they, at this point, the Allies were tired of him making trouble, as they thought, for Switzerland. So they shipped him off to the island of Madeira in the North Atlantic. Now, the problem was that they also cut him off from all his money and refused to allow any of his supporters to send him money. So he and his wife got to Madeira with no money mm. and no place to live. Fortunately, a man lent them his house, but it was a summer house way up in the mountains, and he had wrecked lungs. So he got, he got pneumonia and he died. A very long, lingering, unpleasant death because of the sovereign remedies applied to cure him cupping and things like that what year was that so cupping it's when they you know what year was that oh 1922 yeah. so um interestingly enough the day he died he said some very interesting things one of them was i'm suffering that my peoples might come back together mm -hmm. he said that several times but then at one point he says to his wife as soon as i'm buried you must contact the king of Spain, and he'll take care of you. I've spoken to him, and it'll be all right. 
And she said, you couldn't have spoken to him. There's no way to get through. He says, no, just do as I say. So sure enough, after he was buried, she was able to get through. And the king sent a warship to pick them up. <laughs> and the British complained and said, no, 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 we're not going to let her go until they abdicate all their rights to the throne forever and ever and ever. And King Alfonso XIII said, you can fire on my ship, in which case it'll fire back, we'll be at war. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll just go in and pick them up, which is what happened. So they were in Spain for a few years, and then in Belgium. But, uh, and then it had a hair-raising escape from the Germans after the fall of France. Wild, wild story. Absolutely wild. But uh, Carl, interestingly enough, already after he died, he had a pearly that had been praying for him. That now started praying to him and pushing his beatification. And that organization, the now called the Emperor Carl League for Prayers, mm -hmm. are the big, um, the big ones, shall we say, in in promoting his cause. But the way they came to being was strange, because when he was five years old, his father and mother, his father being in the army, was sent to Odenburg, which is now called Schopron, it's in Hungary, but on the Austrian border. Mm -hmm. And there was a nun there, and the nun was the superior of the Ursuline school, but she had a sideline. She was a stigmatic and kind of a mystic. So this priest friend of the Archduke and his wife and his little, little Carl had told her all about the Archducal family and so on. And she said, Mother Vincentia said, that man is going to be emperor one day. But it will be such a great favor to Austria that the devil will do everything he can to ruin him. You must get people to pray for him. Well, they did and their numbers grew and they're the people like who really really pushed through with the beatification mm -hmm. uh, they were they were a fascinating fascinating bunch like so it, he got his first miracle in 2004 he was beatified I was there I saw it he has his second miracle who was a non-Catholic lady in Florida. So, I think I've heard of that. Go, you. Pardon me? I think I heard this. Yeah. Yeah. So, long and the short of it is that old Carl, um, he's, he's on the rise. Now, the question is, why is he so popular? Um, that has to be subdivided. He's popular in Central Europe for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. He's popular in Peru and Mexico because they have certain connections to the Habsburgs. Why he is popular in the United States, though? That's the fascinating question. I deal with it in my book, but I hazard a guess. And the guess is we cannot fathom a leader who is willing to die for us. It just doesn't make any sense. We're used to being bought and sold by our leaders. Mm -hmm. A leader who feels that it's his obligation, if necessary, to give up his life for us. That is a compelling picture. Yeah, I a can think of him picture. or uh, Garcia Moreno down in Ecuador. To... Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, there's also, uh, you know, my, my little joke is that uh, the United States are the world's longest running and most successful Oedipus complex. Uh, but we have basically been without a father since the revolution. And the man himself, rather than some viceroy, is always an exciting thing. So I, I think that's why it is, frankly. And yeah, not, to, not to go off topic, but right when you said that, I could think of uh, Queen Isabella talking about after when Columbus came back, making this proclamation of those those are my children in the new yeah. land that we must help not only educate but take care of and you yeah. know health wise just just down the list of what a king and queen should be doing well 
I'll tell you, I remember years and years ago when the King of Rwanda came out to L.A. I may have told you this story, I don't remember. But uh, a security firm donated its services. So you have the king, the chancellor, his chancellor, myself, his ADC. And you had maybe 15 or 20 of these pretty hard-bitten security guys. Mm. You know, a lot of them were ex-cops, ex-vets. You know, these were not easily impressed people. But after the end of six days, or however long the stay was, he took his leave of them. And he, I, I'll never forget this to the end of my days. He sat there in the chair, and starting with the commander of the, the detachment. One by one, they came up. They knelt in front of him. He blessed them with the sign of the cross. And I'll tell you, the, 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 we were all teary. And then after they left, he turned to me and he said, you know, that is the problem with Americans. You are orphans. And in a lot of ways, Kaiser Carl, I think, answers that unspoken, unacknowledged, unwanted mm -hmm. desire for that kind of leadership. That's my guess, anyway. That's, that's a good guess. <laughs> well, I mean, you look at what we've got for leadership instead. <laughs> yeah. Every four, eight, four to eight years. Yeah. Or if you're in the States, I, 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 where you get in your States? The uh, governors. So, <laughs> what do you the, hope somebody the, takes away from the book, uh, besides historical context of Felicity Carl? Well, several things. The first thing I think you would take away from the book is the way that God does intervene in in life, in affairs. Uh, I neglected to mention that once they got to Spain, uh, Queen Zita, Queen Empress Zita, was chatting with King Alfonso of Spain and said, you know, why did you uh, push through for us like this? He said, well, you know, it's the strangest thing. But the day they sent word that your husband was dying, I suddenly had the strangest feeling that if I didn't take care of you, my own wife and children would end up in the same position one day. <laughs> and so then she told him about what her husband had said about speaking to the King of Spain. They just sort of, you know, shrugged their shoulders and stared. <laughs> but uh, so that's one of the things. I think another thing that you'll be able to take away from the book uh, is the fact that sanctity is available to anyone in any state in life if they want it. But you have to want it, so you've got to pursue it. Uh, I think also that you'll see the, the importance of mass and devotions. Huge part of his life. And, yeah, I, and I also feel that you'll see an idea of the way leaders should be. Uh, and also the virtue of staying true to the course, you know, to be right, even while everything is falling apart around you. Mm -hmm. That's very important. It's a lesson that we simply can't get too much of. Every time I, I, I get a note, well, you know, society would feel differently. Who cares about society? Society is like a, a topless film festival. Who cares? what society thinks about anything. What's important is what God thinks. What's important is what your conscience thinks. What's important is what's right. The rest of it, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's so awful. What if people don't approve? Oh. I remember Fulham Sheen, I think, said that once. Too. Who are they? Who no. <laughs> Who are they indeed? A bunch of frightened little munchkins. Who are you know they're all they're all uh, brave and they're a mob, but if an individual gets pulled away from the pack and has to account for himself, ooh, then things get very different. Oh yes, I uh, remember apropos of nothing, the riots in L.A. in '92. Mm -hmm. Well, you know nobody gets more belligerent than a liberal who's fearful. And the city of Beverly Hills is a fairly liberal place, but they gave orders to the police to shoot to kill mm -hmm. anybody who crossed the, the Beverly Hills to the town limit. So this mob of rioters comes up, and three or four or five of them 
stupidly cross the painted line and pop, 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 boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And then the rioters went elsewhere because they stopped being a mob at that moment. Mm. I don't think that's a happy ending. But I do think it's something to bear in mind. Uh, people in mobs are very unpleasant. Yeah, think about, uh, it wasn't mob related, but Moreno, after an earthquake in somewhere in Ecuador, somebody was trying to uh, boost up, as you say, the prices of their uh, some of the necessities. Yeah. So he has them arrested, publicly flogs them in the middle of the middle of town, and somehow nobody did that ever again. <laughs> no, life is funny that way. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why people are so afraid. They should have stood up to it. So yeah, nobody I, said, "I'm going to charge hey, whatever I market. want." <laughs> yeah. Uh. Anyway, you got the other questions for me? That's about it. Uh, appreciate it. And that's uh, Charles Cologne's book, uh, Blessed Charles of Austria, available at tanbooks.com in August. But you can pre-order it now on the website. The link will be below in the show notes. And, yeah, anything else? To, any last words, Charles? Yeah. Uh, it was a great honor and a great pleasure to do it, uh, to give a voice to a man that we haven't heard enough from. Amen to that. I, I have a bunch of his prayer cards, and every time I go to a uh, event, there's always five to ten people that will point, who is that guy? And they're intrigued with the story. And somebody will always say, I'm actually from that area, and I don't know who he is. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> anyway, Charles, thank you for your time. He's Charles Colomb. Uh, buy all his books. Uh, take yes, each and every one. <laughs> May your tribe increase. So remember, operators are standing by. Void were prohibited. No CODs uh, or postal money orders accepted. If you act now. Oh, if you act now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Wait, there's more. Operators are, operators are standing by. So do it. <laughs> Charles, thank you. You bet. God bless.